Hello, threshold voltage is one of the most important parameters of MOS transistor. So it's only natural that a good understanding of its origin is important in circuit design. This understanding would help us to better understand the different regions of operations of MOS transistor. It would also help us better appreciate various temperature and process variations in threshold voltage. At the same time, various second order and short channel effects would make better intuitive sense. We would also better understand the differences and similarities between different flavors of transistors available in a given technology. So there is lot to gain from this understanding. You may remember from your device physics class that threshold voltage has very complicated and mathematical derivation. In this video we will leave out the complicated mathematical part and would focus on more intuitive understanding. There are two popular approaches to understand threshold voltage. The first approach takes energy band diagram root. Second approach uses charge balance. Both approaches add different dimension to the understanding of threshold voltage. In this video we will start with the charge balance approach and use energy band diagram whenever that makes better intuitive sense. Also in most of the video I would take NMOS as an example to explain the concepts. So let's start with a very simplistic view of threshold voltage because even that gives some very useful insights. So what is threshold voltage in very simple terms? Threshold voltage is minimum gate voltage required to create a conductive channel of minority carriers beneath the gate. So in P substrate the minority carriers are electrons. So we need to create a channel of electrons over here. And in order to attract electrons which are negatively charged we need to apply a positive voltage at the gate. Now there is an oxide between gate and substrate. So how does threshold voltage change if we increase the thickness of this oxide? So notice that for the thicker oxide gate is further away from the substrate. So it needs to apply greater amount of force to attract the same number of electrons. So we should expect higher threshold voltage if we increase the thickness of the oxide. Now let's consider substrate doping. How would threshold voltage change if I increase the doping concentration of the substrate? If we increase the substrate doping concentration then number of electrons which are minority carriers would reduce even further. So it is only natural to expect that gate needs to apply even greater force to attract same number of electrons. So we should expect higher threshold voltage with higher doping concentration. Now we would derive a more quantitative expression of threshold voltage. But whatever that expression is, it should also support these two observations. Now, in order to derive the basic expression of threshold voltage, we don't really need the whole of MOS transistor. We can actually work with a simpler structure called two terminal MOS capacitor. So here is the two terminal MOS capacitor. Here I have rotated the structure by 90 degree. Now a capacitor is a structure where an insulator is sandwiched between two metal plates. In the MOS capacitor we have got one metal plate and the oxide which is actually an insulator. But the second plate is not really a metal, it's a semiconductor which is somewhere in between metal and insulator. And this semiconductor is what makes this structure much more interesting. So recall the basic operation of the capacitor that if we apply a voltage at one terminal, say positive voltage, then it would create a positive charge on this plate which has to be balanced by the equal and opposite charge on the other plate. The voltage drops across the insulator. Now before we apply a positive voltage across this structure, let's first apply a negative voltage and see what happens. This negative voltage would create a negative charge on the metal plate and it would require an equal and opposite charge on the other side of oxide to balance this negative charge. Now since substrate is p-type, it has plenty of positively charged carriers in form of holes. So these holes would be accumulated on the other side of oxide boundary. Now this looks very similar to what would happen in a normal capacitor. And as a matter of fact this structure would behave like a normal capacitor if we apply a negative voltage across it. This region of operation is known as accumulation. If you see poly well capacitor in your technology device list then it is using accumulation region of operation. Now let's apply a positive voltage and see what happens. A positive gate voltage would create positive charge on the metal side and it would require an equal negative charge on the semiconductor side. 
This negative charge is created in two steps. In the beginning, the holes which are positively charged majority carriers will be driven away from the oxide semiconductor boundary. And this would leave the negatively charged acceptors ion behind. These negatively charged ions would provide the charge required to balance the positive charge on the metal side. But there is a difference between charge in the metal side and charge in the semiconductor side. While charge on the metal side is concentrated in very thin sheet, charge on the semiconductor side would be more dispersed. And as a result, unlike a metal-metal capacitor, where all the applied voltage dropped across insulator alone, in this case some voltage would drop across semiconductor as well. And if we plot the voltage profile across this MOS structure, it would look something like this. So total voltage Vg is divided between the oxide voltage psi ox and the silicon voltage psi silicon. Psi silicon is the voltage across oxide semiconductor boundary and it is also known as surface potential. If we keep increasing the gate voltage, then eventually it would create a thin sheet of electron channel on oxide semiconductor boundary by collecting whatever minority carrier electrons are available. Now the question is, what value of this positive gate voltage is termed as threshold voltage? Now this is the part which I feel is better understood in terms of energy band diagram. Recall that semiconductors have a conduction band and a valence band which are separated by an energy band gap. Fermi level is the energy level where probability of finding an electron is 50%. So in an undoped semiconductor, where there are equal numbers of electrons and holes, Fermi level sits almost in the middle of conduction band and the valence band. In the p-type semiconductors, where electrons are minority carriers, the probability of finding electron at higher energy levels is pretty low, so Fermi level comes down. Higher the doping concentration, lower the Fermi level moves. Similarly for the n-type semiconductor, Fermi level moves up. In a nutshell, Fermi level gives the relative concentration of electrons and holes at a given point in the semiconductor. So if the Fermi level is below the intrinsic level, then there are more holes than electrons and if it is above, then there are more electrons than holes. Now it is possible to change the relative concentration of carrier inside a given semiconductor by applying an external voltage. For example, if you apply a positive voltage on the left side, at the same time ensuring that there is no current flow, then electron would tend to accumulate on that side. And that would create a non-uniform electron concentration across the semiconductor. This type of scenario is represented by band bending in the band diagram. So here this red board line shows the band bending in response to a positive voltage on the left side. And this green line is the Fermi level of the p-type semiconductor. So you can notice on the left side that because of this bending, Fermi level now has come in the middle of the conduction band and the valence band. Now if this voltage is increased any further, the Fermi level will go above the intrinsic Fermi level. And that means in this region, the p-type semiconductor would actually look like an n-type semiconductor. Now let's start with a p-type silicon where Fermi level is phi f below the undoped Fermi level. Now, threshold voltage is defined as the value of gate voltage which causes so much band bending at oxide semiconductor surface that Fermi level comes phi f above the undoped semiconductor Fermi level. Now, this is a very important point, so let's try to understand it again. So, we started with a p-type semiconductor with some phi f value. Now, we applied a positive gate voltage which caused some voltage drop across the semiconductor. In terms of energy band diagram, this means bending of the energy levels. So higher the gate voltage, higher the voltage across semiconductor and bigger the bending. Here at the oxide semiconductor boundary, Fermi level is actually much above the undoped Fermi level. And if this level is also phi f, then that particular gate voltage is the threshold voltage. In other words, at the surface, this p-type semiconductor is as much n-type as it was p-type to begin with. Also, it is easy to notice that at threshold voltage, the total band bending is 2 phi f. That means the surface potential is also 2 phi f. So in yet another words, threshold voltage is the gate voltage which causes a surface potential of 2 phi f. 
Okay, so we have figured out one part of the threshold voltage, which is 25F, and it depends on substrate doping concentration. Higher the substrate doping concentration, bigger this voltage, and this incidentally matches our previous understanding. So how about the second part, which is the voltage across oxide? Now the voltage across oxide is simply the charge across oxide divided by the oxide capacitance. Now since both these quantities are proportional to the surface area, we can take area out of the picture and simplify the things a bit. So this prime symbol indicates the quantity of the unit area. As we have discussed earlier, charge in the semiconductor side is made of two components. The charge due to immobile acceptor ions which is also known as depletion charge and charge due to minority electrons which is also known as inversion charge. Now this is where the mathematics becomes really complicated. Fortunately, we can make some reasonable assumptions and keep things simple. The first assumption is that we can ignore the charge due to minority carrier electrons for the calculation of threshold voltage. Now this is a reasonable assumption because substrate doping concentration is not very high. So by the time we reach the threshold voltage, the electron concentration has not built up sufficiently. That means the charge is dominated by the depletion charge. So how do we calculate the depletion charge? If substrate doping concentration is an A, then the depletion region charge density will also be an A. So if we somehow know the width of this depletion region, we can calculate the total charge. Now if you look carefully, this depletion region looks very similar to the p-type depletion region of a p-n junction diode. In fact, this depletion region is known as field induced diode. So we can use the p-n junction formula to calculate this width. So after putting the equation of d and some simplification, we arrive at this equation. Here epsilon si is permittivity of the silicon. Now for a given technology, this term is a constant and it is known as body effect constant. So now let us come back to our starting equation. So here we are able to express the gate voltage in terms of a technology constant gamma and the surface potential. And we already know that at threshold voltage this surface potential is 2 phi f. So here we have a threshold voltage equation. Now notice that as we increase the gate oxide thickness the oxide capacitance reduces and in turn the gamma increases and that in turn would increase the second term of the threshold voltage. So this equation tallies with our original expectation that as we increase the gate oxide thickness the threshold voltage should increase. But we are not quite done yet. There are a couple of more things that we need to add to this equation. First we need to take into account various oxide and surface trap charges. During manufacturing process oxides tend to trap many metal ions. Also, oxide semiconductor interface contains many surface defects. Majority of these trapped ion and surface defects are positively charged even for the PMOS. In NMOS, effect of these positive charges is to reduce the threshold voltage. This is because any positive charge would assist in attracting the electrons. The most common way to account for these charges is to make an equivalent charge density at the surface and subtract it from the threshold equation. The second effect to be considered is contact potential. Whenever any two dissimilar materials are joined together, it develops a contact potential across the interface. This effect is very similar to the contact potential developed across a p-n junction diode. Contact potential is equal to the difference of the work function of the two materials. Wurf function is actually a measure of electron energies. We don't need to go into too much details of the exact mechanism of Wurf function, but we can just assume that metal, oxide and semiconductors have three different work function. So the first contact potential will be developed at this interface and other contact potential will come here. So if we take a trip from metal to oxide to semiconductor, the oxide work function will cancel out. We need to add this contact potential to this overall threshold voltage equation. These last two terms together is also known as flat band voltage. And here is our final equation of threshold voltage. There is still much to discuss. For example, the numerical values and meaning of these terms, the temperature and process effects and various flavors of MOS transfer which are available. 
and that would be the topic of the next video. So for now, post your comments below and thanks for watching.